Anselm's Argument for God's Existence One of the famous arguments for the existence of God is the ontological argument. And as is well known, of all the versions of the ontological argument, it is Anselm's argument for God's existence that stands out the most. What is common among these versions of the ontological argument, including Anselm's argument for God's existence, is the claim that it is self-contradictory to deny the existence of a greatest possible being. In other words, for the adherence of the ontological argument, the existence of a greatest possible being is necessary, and he is God. Therefore, God exists. On a side note, according to Norman Melkert, the term ontological comes from the ancient Greek word onto, which means being. The term ontological argument was given such name in the 18th century by one of its critics, namely Immanuel Kant. This is because unlike the argument of St. Thomas Aquinas, it does not begin from facts about the world from which the term cosmological arguments was derived. Instead, it goes straight from the idea of God to the conclusion about His being and His necessary existence. According to Melkert, many thinkers find it important to distinguish two or even more distinct arguments because at least one form of the argument is pretty obviously invalid. In his version of the ontological argument, Anselm does not do so. Many thinkers interpret Anselm's argument as one argument. And so let us now briefly sketch Anselm's argument for God's existence. For Anselm, God does not just exist but God truly and necessarily exists so that it is impossible for us to think that He does not exist. According to Melkert, this apparently simple yet deeply perplexing argument is called in the history of philosophy as ontological argument. Anselm's ontological proof of God's existence which he developed in his famous work titled Proslogium, begins with a definition of God. But the idea of definition here does not necessarily refer to the idea of something as produced by experience. By definition, Anselm means our rather abstract conception of God when we utter the word God. For Anselm, God is is a being in which nothing greater can be thought of, or in Anselm's own words, that than which no greater can be conceived. According to Melkert, Anselm used this convoluted phrase for two reasons. On the one hand, Anselm does not want the idea of God to be limited by what we may be able to conceive. On the other hand, Anselm does not want to suggest that a positive conception of God can be entirely comprehensible by us. Suppose we are thinking or conceiving of a certain being. According to Anselm, if the mind can still conceive of something greater than what we have just thought, then it is not yet God that we have conceived. This is because it is not yet that than which no greater can be conceived. Hence, as we can see, Anselm's ontological proof of God's existence rests entirely on the conception of a being in which nothing greater can be thought of, or again, in Anselm's words, that than which no greater can be conceived. It is important to note that this line of thinking was framed in terms of the Augustinian notion of a great chain of being. As we may already know, the great chain of being is a hierarchical structure of all matter and life, which in medieval Christianity has been understood as being decreed by God. 
This means that the world is ordered by the degrees of being and value in its various parts. For example, the tree is higher than the stone, while humans are higher than the trees, and so on. Now, if we move up and down the chain, it would appear pretty obvious that we can easily conceive of lesser and greater beings. And in doing so, we are inevitably led to think of an idea of something that is not only greater than other things, but of an idea of something that we cannot even think of a greater. As Anselm would have us believe, this being, which is at the highest point of the great chain of being, is God. Now, if God is a being in which nothing greater can be conceived, is there such being in reality? Of course, it might be the case that this being in which nothing greater can be thought of exists only in the mind, like the idea of a golden mountain or a unicorn. As we can see, this calls to mind the contention of the atheists that there is no God. In response to this, Anselm argues that the claim that God does not exist in reality is absurd, because while we utter the words there is no God or God does not exist, we cannot clearly think what we mean without falling into the pit of contradiction. This is because the idea of God appears to be self-evident. If we think of the great chain of being, we cannot help but affirm the existence of a being in which nothing greater can be conceived. God, therefore, necessarily exists. As we can see, the atheists are wrong, at least for Anselm. Indeed, for Anselm, the statement, there is no God, or God does not exist, is absolutely false. Hence, as Anselm argues, it follows not only that God exists, but also that it is impossible that he does not exist. Melkert puts Anselm's argument for God's existence this way. 1. God does not exist. 2. By God, I mean that than which no greater can be conceived, NGC. So NGC does not exist, from 1 and 2. So NGC has being only in my understanding, not also in reality, from 2 and 3. Now, if NGC were to exist in reality as well as in my understanding, it would be greater, from the meaning of greater. But then, NGC is not NGC, from 4 and 5. So, NGC cannot exist only in my understanding, from 6. So, NGC must exist also in reality from 5 and 7. So, God exists, from 2 and 8. So, God does not exist, and God exists, from 1 and 9. So, premise 1 cannot be true, by 1 through 10, and the principle of reductio ad absurdum. So, God exists, from 11. Anselm's argument for God's existence, as we can see, moves from God's essence to God's existence. In other words, it moves from our understanding of what God is to the fact that God is. In certain clear sense, the argument is a claim that the existence of God is self-evident. What that means is that it is enough to understand the conception of God to know that God must exist. Nothing else is required. God's essence entails God's existence.
Anselm used this convoluted phrase for two reasons.